Welcome to the 11.30 a.m. Wednesday Luncheon Bible Study. This comes from Doctrinal Studies Bible Church in Birmingham, Alabama. And we thank you for being with us today. Uh, we normally have a luncheon at our church at this hour. Uh, people taking their lunch break come in and uh, they eat and I teach. And But we're under that COVID-19 concept of responsibility as a church. So we're not ready to sit down close to each other and eat yet. We hope to do that in July. But we'll see how things go as far as our here in Birmingham, our, we're, we're spiking again a little bit So, in, in uh, this virus. So we don't know from time to time where we're going to be. But we are in a series called Quench Not the Spirit. We have this lesson and one more. We'll, 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 we'll enter a new Bible study in July. But this is our fourth lesson in Quench Not the Spirit, uh, which comes from 1 Thessalonians 5.19. And it was the last lesson of a series called Let Not Your Hearts Be Troubled. And the first lesson in Quench Not the Spirit. In lesson one, uh, we did an introduction. I'm going to do, um, do a little review, and then I'll have prayer. In lesson one, we introduced one way a believer could quench the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit. I could quench it, and that was by walking in the flesh that produces personal sin. In Galatians 5, 16, 17, the antidote to that or the answer to that is walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh, i.e. personal sin. And so we talked about that because the, the, the importance of walking in the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. If you walk in the flesh, you get the deeds of the flesh in Galatians 5. So the, the antidote, the spiritual solution uh, to the problem of habitual sin in your life as a believer is walking in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the sin nature, the lust of the sin nature, which produces sin, uh, James 1, 14 and 15. So we talked about that in Lesson 1. In Lesson 2, uh, we studied a second way you can quench the Holy Spirit in the Christian life, and that was to put yourself under the law, the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law is Old Covenant. It was designed, Paul said in the book of Galatians, third chapter 24, it was designed, the entire Mosaic law was designed to point you as a tutor to point you to Christ so that you could be justified by faith and not works. And so we talked about that in Galatians 5, 18 and 19. In our third lesson, uh, we, uh, and the, the antidote to the second lesson of the law was to be led, to be led by the Spirit to grace and not works of the law. In lesson three, we studied a third way that you could quench the Holy Spirit, and that was to engage in negative volition against the teaching and recall ministry of the Word of God by the Holy Spirit. We taught that idea out of John 14, 26. And of course, negative volition, it can be, it can be primary or secondary. Primary, oh, I don't want to hear it. I'm not going to go to church. I don't care. Uh, he teaches too much. He, uh, uh, you, don't want to go, you don't want to hear it. Because, you see, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Romans 10, 7, you shut that down, it's a primary. Secondary is you go to church, you get the message, but you don't want to, you, you don't want to apply it to your life. You'd rather apply the pleasures of the flesh than walk in the Spirit and overcome some of the issues in your life uh, that uh, deal with habitual sin. Well, we talked about that uh, in the third lesson. And today we're in the fourth lesson. And today we're going to J John 16, 13. So you can get your Bibles and get them open in a minute. We're going to look at that, and we're going to study it. We're going to see some really strong, important points. In uh, lesson number four, we're going to look at four ways. The Bible says that one of the great ministries of the Holy Spirit is to guide and disclose the Word of God to you. 
uh, to guide and disclose. And that's in John 16, 13. That's very important for us. And the problem with it is that there are false guides. There are false guides or teachers that come along and tell you you're going the wrong way, that whoever's guiding you is guiding you wrong. And you have to be aware of that. And so the, you have the Holy indwelling Holy Spirit is there to disclose and to disclose, to guide and disclose, to guide and disclose uh, all the truth of the Word of God scripturally. And we're going to have a, a, a great study on that in, in today to understand what John 16, 13 means when the Holy Spirit comes, he will do this. So let's stop right for a moment. Having done a quick review, let's go back. Let's have a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't learn it. You can't live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. How do we get out of carnality and back to spirituality of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit? One verse that tells you this is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That cleansing is the work of Christ to the Christian life, the work of Christ from the, from the cross, the cross where he shed his blood to cleanse us his blood cleanses us from our sins. 1 John 1, 7 teaches that. Now, for the unbeliever, when he comes to the cross, the blood of Christ cleanses him from Adam's sin, Romans, the fifth chapter. The 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin is removed from his life once and forever. But for the blood of Christ to work in the Christian life is through confession of sin. He cleanses the Christian restores him to spirituality because this is the age of the great ministry of the Holy Spirit. The advent of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I've got to go back to the Father. The third member is going to take my place. The second member is going to go back to heaven, and the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, is going to take his place. Another comforter will take his place. And that's what we're talking about under quench not the spirit. That's what our point is. Well, let's pause for a moment. Confess your sins if necessary. Let's pray to the Holy Spirit that he would teach. And in this guide us and disclose to us all the truth of the word of God that's necessary for my life to be lived in a way that honors and brings glory to God through his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the love and mercy and grace of God that's been bestowed on me as a gift by the work of Christ on the cross, not by my work, but by thy word, not by my will, but by his will. So thankful, Father, so thankful that I can confess my sin and be restored to the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit because it's a personal sin issue. Jesus took care of that on the cross. He died once for all sin, Adamic and personal. It's what a, wonderful, what a wonderful thing to know that, Father, and have the confidence that I can be cleansed and restored to spiritual life through confession of sin. I pray today, Father, as we come and approach the subject matter of the guidance and disclosure of all truth in the Christian life for the new covenant and the church age, encourage our hearts and teach us, Father, in this introductory idea. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to look at four things today about the indwelling Holy Spirit guiding and disclosing all truth. It's a very interesting concept, point number one. We will begin by dividing our lesson text, which is only one. It's, I've, ta I've taken John 16, 13. Now, the context of it is important. I'm looking at John 16, 13. The context is 12 through 15. But I'm looking at verse 13. I'm just telling you where the bigger picture is. This is a verse that comes from a bigger picture. I, I want to look at three aspects. I'm going to take this verse. I'm going to break it down in three parts. 
Now, if you have a study guide, we provide a study guide. You have to print it off, but we have a study guide. If you have a study guide, you'll see under point one, I broke 16, 13 in three parts. If you don't, then you know that when you come to my Bible study at lunch, bring a Bible, a piece of paper, and a pencil. Now, here's why you're going to need it. I'm going to take verse 16. I'm going to take verse 13 of chapter 16 of John, and we're breaking it in three parts. Here's the first part. I'm going to read the first part, and I'm going to tell you. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, that's all I want to say for you right there, and I want, I, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that the, the word but, I'm going to go over here to John 16, 13, because I, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me, and I want you to take a look at this word, but. 16, 13. See the word, but? Then he goes, when? The word, but, is in the Greek language is D-E, day. It's called adversative or contrast. He has said something that he's going to contrast. Now, so you have to go back to verse 12. Here's what Jesus said. I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, he's been talking about the Holy Spirit's ministry, that he's got to leave and the Holy Spirit's going to come. The second member of the Godhead is going to return to heaven. The third member of God is going to take up his ministry. His ministry, the comforter, is going to take another comforter is going to take his place. And so we're talking about what that involves. Jesus is preparing his disciples just prior to going to the cross about what's going to come at Pentecost in 30 AD. So this is very important. The word in verse 13, the word but is contrasting or adversative. I have, I have many more things to say to you. I don't forget that now. I got a lot more to say to you doctrinally, spiritually, but I cannot because you can't handle it. But, watch this now, when, that's hoten, it's connected to a subjunctive, and it's an event, a time and event. When, you know, when, a time and event. Now watch, watch, that's the time and event. They're connected. When he, here's the time and event. When he, the spirit of truth, which previously has been called the comforter, now called the spirit of truth. That's a functional title. When he comes, that's a functional title. The spirit of truth will speak the truth. You got to get this. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, erkoomai is aorist, active subjunctive. Aorist tense at a point in time, divorced from time, except in the plan of God in biblical history. The aorist tense is the tense of biblical history. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, that's the advent of the Holy Spirit. Write that down. That's the advent of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, when he comes, that's the advent of the Holy Spirit. The, act, the aorist tense is some point in biblical history when, when Jesus leaves the earth, the when, Jesus has got to leave, and then he's going to come. Now, he's been talking about that in chapter 14, 15, and now talking about it in 16. We've been talking about it. I'm in my fourth lesson. You've, you've got to study the Bible to understand it. You, geez, come on, guys. All right? Now, here's what's interesting. 
When you look at John 16, 12 through 15, from which our text comes from, we call that context, text of the context. He's talking to the church about the church. He's talking to his disciples about the church. Watch this. In John 16, 7 through 11, he talks about the Holy Spirit coming to the world where he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. The advent of the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world. Now, Jesus has turned his subject back to the Holy Spirit and the ministry. The Holy Spirit has the church. And he said, I've got a lot more to tell you about the Holy Spirit's work, but you, you're, you can't handle it right now. But when the Holy Spirit comes, now listen to me. You're, you're missing this. Jesus is going to die on a cross. He's going to be buried and raised from the dead on the third day of his burial. Watch this now. But he doesn't go home immediately. He does not go home immediately. He doesn't go back to heaven immediately. Now pay attention to me. From the resurrection first fruits of Passover, which was Sunday or the first day of the week, Jesus was declared raised from the dead. The Jews began to count seven complete Sabbaths, and on the 50th day, which is called Pentecost in the Greek, the Feast of Weeks becomes the Feast of Harvest. We call it Pentecost. It's a Greek term, and it's a biblical term, and it's a church-age term. Now, if I could get you to understand that, a lot of screwy theology would be cleared up. That's Leviticus 23, by the way. Now, look. In that 50-day period, Jesus raised from the dead. He does not go immediately back to the Father. He spends 40 days on the earth in what's called post-resurrection appearances with his disciples teaching him. Teaching him on the same subject. He picks up the subject. But listen to me. When he leaves the earth after 40 days of picking up the subject and teaching some more, they, they haven't advanced any further in their knowledge than they were before he was raised from the dead on regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? John 16, 13. Let me read it again. In verse 12, he said, I've got a lot more to teach to you on this subject matter of the Holy Spirit, the advent of the Holy Spirit, but I can't because you can't handle it. He's going to go to the cross, die. He's going to be buried. He's going to be raised from the dead. He's going to spend 40 days in post-resurrection appearances. Then he's going to 10 days short of Pentecost. He's going to go back to the Father. He's going to, he's going to go through a coronation of sitting on the right hand of God the Father uh, on the throne with all authority business. On the 50th day, we're going to have the advent of the Holy Spirit. It, and listen, from the resurrection prior to the death, after he's seated at the right hand of God the Father, listen, this is when this occurs. He says, I can't teach you now. Look at verse 13 again. You've got to get this. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you and he will disclose. You can't handle this information on the Holy Spirit right now. Listen, he spent 40 days teaching again on it. They weren't any closer to it other than getting a lot of information that they would be able to recall when the Holy Spirit came and was able to recall it and put it into some kind of new, new covenant, church age, informational 
system in their mind. The church was a mystery. It's appalling to me as a pastor of the Word of God that so few Christians understand the mystery doctrines of the church age, of the church. It surprises me that they don't realize they're under a new covenant and we're in a church age. We're not in the old covenant age. Well, anyhow, here's the point. Here's the doctrinal point that goes with what I just said. I just dealt with point A of verse 13. Now, I want you to make sure you get this. 50 days after his resurrection, 50 days after his resurrection, Jesus, sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, baptized 120 disciples, followers of Christ, into the body of Christ the church by the Holy Spirit. He baptized them with the Holy Spirit. That's Matthew 3.11. That's Acts 1, 4 through 5. That's Acts 2.33. Acts 2.33. Listen to Acts 2.33. I'm going to read 32 and 33. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. This is a Pentecostal message. Therefore, that word therefore is used twice. It's used in verse 33 and again in 36. Well worth your time to pay attention. Therefore, that's like a trailer hitch connected to what he's been previously saying. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this, what you both see and hear, that's Pentecost. The advent of the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizing the advent of the Holy Spirit. My, 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 is when the church age began. It's when the 120 become the body, and then they're saved daily, become part of the body. 3,000 become the body. 5,000 become the body. Here we are, part of the body. Galatians 3.27, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ into the, and into the church. That's the baptismal work of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit in heaven being sent to earth and what he does when he's brought to earth and then what he continues. Jesus baptized 123, and then he starts baptizing the rest of them. My goodness, you need to read 1 Corinthians, the 12th 12, 12th chapter. You need to read Galatians 3:27. You need to listen. Jesus got to baptize with the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to baptize. That's an earthly ministry, the Holy Spirit's ministry. My, my, my. Just think what you can learn when you study the Bible. <laughs> study the Bible. Here's point B. I'm still in 1613. When he comes, he the indwelling Holy Spirit, when he comes, when he comes, when he comes, indwelling the believer, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, he, the indwelling Holy Spirit, will guide, future active indicative, he's got to come first, he will guide you, guide you, notice, well, if you don't have a study guide, that word, you, is the Greek word, su, S-U, and it's plural. In the South, we say you all, and we mean you all. You all. He will guide you all. You know what he's, you know what he's, you know what he's talking about? He's talking about the church. He's talking about the believer in Jesus Christ. He's talking about the church. It get, began with 120, and then the Holy Spirit began to baptize one by one, and then 3,000, 5,000, and he did you and I. The moment we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to the third day. That gospel is the power of God to save you when you believe it. 
You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift. I just quoted you 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, and Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He will guide you. Now that he is in you, he will guide you. That word guide, hodegeo, is a word that means a guide instructor. A trail guide. When I came to the south, I got a job through my uncle, Michael Max, with Southern Natural Gas. That's what the name of it was when I came to the south. I was a college student at UAB in pre-dentistry. And the summer job, they hired guys like me, the college guys. Most of the guys were on uh, a co-op program, a scholarship co-op program, and they were engineers going to schools like Auburn and Alabama and places like that, uh, Mississippi State. And we walked pipeline. We would go to class, and they would teach us how to walk a pipeline, how to equip ourselves, what kind of boots, and, and what to look for. And, and we were to find, we were looking for leaks, gas leaks. And they taught us about mile markers and where we would start and where we would meet and the dangers uh, crossing rivers and snakes and bugs and all that stuff. Then they would take us out with a guide on our first walk. They'd put us on a, on a mile marker, and we would walk to another mile marker, se several mile markers away. And when we got to our final marker, we would wait. If they weren't waiting on us, then we would stop and wait on them. They would pick us up and decide whether or not we would walk again or, or go in back to the shop. They gave us an instructor. We went to instruction. Then they gave us a trail guide, a senior, walk, a senior guy in the company, uh, somebody that was very familiar with this. And I'll tell you, there's a, a, lo a lot of things that was really important to a guy like me. For example, as a rookie, I could, this, all the rookies could not tell the difference between a gas leak and a rattlesnake. The, the sound of a rattlesnake, the early sound of a rattlesnake and a gas leak. So you had to be really careful when you heard what you thought was a gas leak when you investigated and marked it down between the markers and where it was located. There was a lot of those kind of lessons. The trail guide was a really important guy. He was an a trail inspector or a guide, an instructor. That's the word we have here, guide. That is the word, guide. He will guide you. Now, watch what. He will guide you into some truth. Mm -mm. All truth. All truth. Now, watch this. The indwelling Holy Spirit, write this down. It's not on your paper. The indwelling Holy Spirit is not the source of all truth. Your Bible didn't say that. But what he did say is that he was the guide. God is the source of all truth. Jesus can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, because he's, the, God, he, he's the, the son of the almighty God. The Holy Spirit is not the source. The Bible makes it clear he's the guide. Don't make that mistake. Now watch the word for. He will guide you into all truth, 
for, this is explanatory gar. He's going to explain to you how he guides. The first thing he's going to say is he's not the source. He's the guide. Watch this. For he will not speak. That's laleo, communicate. Of his own initiative. He's not the source. But in contrast, that, that's Allah. Whatever he hears, he will speak. In the council of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son, as they are working to plan in heaven, as they're working the plan of God out in heaven, he's brought into council, and he speaks what he hears. He's a guide. He gets his orders from the, the, the council that he's a member of, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Isn't that interesting? It should be. Bye-bye. Whatever he hears, he communicates. Here's the doctrine and principle. Write this down. The indwelling Holy Spirit will guide the church. Remember, this is plural. It's not singular. Will guide the church into all truth. And note, it comes with an explanation of how the Holy Spirit does it. He's part of the master council. God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. He takes his order, his marching orders out of the council, out of the Godhead council. Can you understand how God works in your life? I mean, you get so pinpointed on some kind of issue in your life. Oh, this is just, oh my goodness. And the Holy Spirit is there to disclose, to guide you and disclose. You'll see in a minute. To guide you into all the truth necessary for your decisions to be compatible with the plan of God. And that's what makes all this stuff works in our life. It's not left off us to figure it all out. Let him guide you. He is the, not only the trailblazer, but the trail instructor. He's the mastermind from the counsel of God to your life. Let him guide you. My goodness, people. Stop trying to guide yourself. When he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak from his own, but rather from what he hears from the consul, he will speak to you. I mean, you can't get it. You can't get it better counsel than that. God the Father signed off. God the Son has signed off. Now the Holy Spirit signs off on whatever's going on in your life. We're talking about what's going on in your life. He takes Ron Adama out on the, out on the, on the trail to look for leaks. Gas line. The tr the, walk the gas line. Your life is no different. What's going on in your life? You need to be guided in the decisions you make and the choices you make. It is his responsibility to guide you into all truth. And he's doing it right on the spur, right from the counsel of God to your life. When he tells you and he guides you, it is, he is speaking on behalf of the Father and the Son to your life. You've got to start listening to that. Do you not hear him when he speaks the word of God as truth to your life, when he speaks it as truth? You shall know the truth, Jesus said, and will set you free. What are you worried about today? What you got you? What are you wringing your hands in your life over? You got the whole counsel of God working on your behalf. 
Why are you sweating it? Let me tell you the third thing. I'm still in verse 13. And that's a connection. That's a connective link to guide. This is a trailer hitch. He's hooking up guide and disclose. Watch this. And he, the guide, will disclose to you, the church, every member of the body of Christ, what uh -uh. we have the definite article with a participle. That's an articulate participle. That's an articulate. That's a definite article, and it's plural. It's not what is. It's the things to come. It's not what is. It's the things to come. Now, here he is. He's with the consul, and he's gotten exactly your assignment and how to walk you through it. He's your guide. He's going he's to guide you in the truth so that you can make decisions that's compatible with the plan of God. And so you're right on course with the will of God. And he's going to disclose. He's going to disclose to you the things to come. He's talking to the church. He will disclose to you the things to come. When you look at the bigger picture of the Holy Spirit's ministry of all truth to the church of Jesus Christ, and we're in the book of John, St. <laughs> John, the Gospel of John, what he's talking about in the bigger picture of the church age under the new covenant Watch this, is the gospel of John to John's book of Revelation. His job is not only to disclose, guide and disclose in your personal life, but in the life of the church age, the church under the new covenant. The New Testament is the teachings of Christ of the new covenant for the church. It was the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to lay the bigger picture out of the church as well as the inner structure of the Christian life. You talk about a big job. And the Holy Spirit is what recorded Matthew to Revelation. The Holy Spirit. It was his job to disclose things to come. That's dispensational and personal. What an enormous job. So here's the third point. <laughs> Here's the third point. The indwelling Holy Spirit disclosed to the church all the scriptural teachings of the new covenant of the Bible, which we call the 27 books of the New Testament. Do you think that the church age of the new covenant is not a big deal? Do you know where it began? It began at Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit was sent by the consul of God, sent to guide and disclose all the truth. On one side, it is to write the whole canon of Scripture and complete the Bible. On the other hand, it is to bring it to reality in our life personally. What a magnificent guide. Did you know that? Did you know that? You do now. 
I just explained it. Point number two, Jesus' teaching on the coming ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit began in John 14, 16. I want you to write this down. It began in John 14, 16, and it goes to John, the 16th chapter, verse 15. That covers two, it covers the upper room discourse, chapters 13 and 14 of John, and the Olivet discourse, 15, 16, 17. Man, study your Bible. Don't call me or write me until you study your Bible. You won't have enough information to talk. The advent of the Holy Spirit was contingent the advent of the Holy Spirit was contingent upon Jesus returning to the Father and being seated at the right hand of God the Father with all authority. John 16, 7. Listen to what Jesus says, 16, 7. I tell you the truth. Oh, boy. Wouldn't that be good if we could get people to believe that? I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. It is to your advantage, he says to his disciples, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, now called the guide and discloser, the comforter, the helper, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And he did, Pentecost, boom. And then he gets in a discussion about when he comes, what his ministry is to the world and what his ministry is to the church. You should read Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 and 1 Peter 3, 22. Listen to 1 Peter 3, 22. Who, talking about the resurrected Jesus Christ in verse 21, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. You know what that is? That's Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. He beat the devil. He beat the devil. He beat the devil through his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, accession. Well, let me tell you, the, the devil is a roaring lion who has no teeth. All his teeth were pulled out when Jesus went through his ordeal and sat down at the right hand of God the Father. The last person you need to worry about in this world is the devil. The, the, the greatest enemy that you have is you. Getting you to pay attention, disciple. Yeah, you need to read that stuff. You know what the advent of the Holy Spirit was? To continue the teaching of Jesus Christ after we went back in the session because they weren't getting it was to bring it and complete it. Bring back that teaching, the teachings of Jesus Christ called the church age under the new covenant and teach them and bring it and put it in writing and canonize it. Did you know all that? You do now. I just told you. And I gave you scripture for it, did I not? Read it. Three. The guidance and disclosure ministry of the Holy Spirit regarding all truth involved both the writing of the New Testament from 30 to 100 A.D. and the teaching of this writing until the end of the church age. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. All the way to the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Not on your paper. Personally, as a teacher of the Word of God, this helps me and I hope you to understand the importance of biblical hermeneutics. That is the method and principles of interpretation of scriptures. And let me tell you, the best method, I've looked at them all. I've been in this thing over 60 years, is ice. The method, the hermeneutic method of ice do this every time you speak the word of God, every time you study to speak the word of God. Ice, isagogics, the biblical history system, 
that your text is in. Category C, category, categorical doctrine is where spiritual growth, milk and meat come from in the believer's life. It's essential. That's the practical part of your theology. And then exegeting. Exegeting. I did a lot of that today. Not a lot. I did a little of it today. But listen, in my personal study, I did a lot of it to bring you a little. I did a lot to bring you a little. All these little things I told you about were essentially important textually. Exegeting. Finding out what it says in its original language. For example, exegeting. You can't see an imperative in the English. You can't in the Greek. It's spelled out perfect. That's a command. It could be a present command. It could be an heiress command. It could be a future command. But the imperative mood is a command. It's a command of volition. Well, anyhow. Listen to this, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 19, 16 through 17. All Scripture, listen, all Scripture, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, whether it's Old Testament canon or whether another canon is added to call the Bible, we have the Old Canon, we have the New Canon, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Covenant, New Covenant, under one cover called the Bible. All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, this in the Greek, this means God breathed. King James had it right. God breathed. That means inhale and exhale of the Word of God. All Scripture, that's canonized. We have it in the Old Testament. We have it in the New Testament. Quit listening to so much textual criticism. Get back to the Word of God. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable. That's the Christian way of life. It's profitable. That's the Christian way of life. For teaching, for reproof, for correction and righteousness. Expect the word of God to work that way in your life. There's time in your life when it's teaching you and it's an exciting moment to learn. And then there's times when it reproves you. It calls you, it calls you out. It says, look, you're wrong. You're wrong. You've got this stuff all wrong. And he reproves you. He tries to show you how to correct it. He points out the problem and tells you the solution. That's the word of God. That's categorical thinking. And then correction in righteousness. It's all the correction of God is always to take you somewhere. Not to take you to remorse. Not to take you to guilt. It's to take you to righteousness. This is where God operates in a, in a complete state of, of good. Listen, then he says, all scripture is inspired of God, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and righteousness, that, so that the man of God, you know what that word man is? Anthropos. Anthropos is used generically here, like all believers in, in Christ, whether you're a male, this is Galatians uh, 3, 27, 28, 29, whether you're a male or female, whether you're a Jew or Gentile, rich, uh, uh, free or slave, anthropos. That doesn't matter if you're a male or female, doesn't matter if you're this or that. Listen, the word is anthropos, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work, that's divine production. That's not production of the flesh. That's production of the spirit, according to the will of God. All scripture. When you applied this to the Old Testament, everything covered under the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. When it's applied to the New Covenant, it's applied the same way, but to the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit worked alongside certain people, not all people. In the New Testament, works in all people because he indwells every believer to the point of salvation. This should be helpful to you as a pastor teacher of a local body, church body, when you are responsible for their spiritual growth under Hebrews, the fifth chapter 
11 through 15. You need to know milk and meat. You need to feed it to your people. In 2 Timothy, uh, Timothy 2.15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God. For me, that's a nice teacher. I'm hermeneutically a nice guy. And it has worked wonderfully in my ministry. I can't imagine teaching any other way, even though I was taught many other ways to teach. It didn't help my growth of my people like ICE does. Approved to God to present yourself yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed handling accurately the word of God. My responsibility is ice. The Holy Spirit's job is to teach, recall, guide, lead, disclose. I mean, he's got the bigger job than I've got. Now let me close. The danger to the ministry of guidance and disclosure of the indwelling Holy Spirit is putting yourself under false teachers, false guides, false guides, false teachers. Now listen to me. In Matthew 15, 14, Jesus said, let, let them alone. They are, he's talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are under a, a, an apostate system of a law for salvation and spirituality. He said, leave them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into a pit. We would probably say a ditch. That's a danger to you. Find somebody who is consistent in the teaching of the word of God. They don't have one verse and it means this and another verse that means it's different, completely something different, and, st and you keep confused. Well, is it this or is it that? The Holy Spirit is not doing his job if it's this or that. It should be all truth. It is the truth. It's not this or that. Who knows what is true? Who knows who was true? This person says this. Person. The word of God and the Holy Spirit will speak to you all the truth, and the truth will set you free. My, my, my. Come and stay with us for a year. You'll know what I'm talking about. In the greater context of 15, one, uh, 15 the verse I just quoted, 15, 14, is 1 through 14. So be sure to read the greater context of that verse. It will help you. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, I got to close. In the, in the parable of the Good Samaritan, which goes from John 10, 1 through 18, it's in two sections. John 10, 1 through 6 is one section, and then 7 through 18 is another section. In the parable of the Good Shepherd, in John 10, 1 through 6, they didn't understand what he was teaching. So we have John 7, 7 through 18, which says, so he taught him a second time. So he taught him again. That's called repetition. They didn't get it. Listen, when you hear God teaching you over and over again on a subject matter, you're not getting it. So he told him again. You should read the parable of the Good Samaritan this time. And keep those two ideas in mind. Because the Holy Spirit's been sent to guide you and disclose to you. In John, the 10th chapter, verse 7, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, you know, that's like lights out, boy, you pay attention to that deal. I am the door of the sheep. All who come before the door, me, are thieves and robbers. But the sheep, but the sheep did not hear them. There's your false guides. They come to steal and destroy, not Jesus. Jesus came to give his life for the sheep. He says the thief comes to steal, to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. Well, be careful of false guides. Because the devil is behind him. 2 Timothy 2.26.
They finally came to their senses and they escaped from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Don't let that happen to you, my buddy. It shouldn't because the Holy Spirit indwells you. You got to become a, a, a person who submits to the guide and the disclosure of all truth to your life and be honorable with it by positive volition to do what he's instructed you and is guiding you to do it. You're not alone in your decision process and you're not alone in fulfilling it. He'll walk you through it. He'll walk you. He can't leave you, John 14, 16. I'm going to talk about it next week on Wednesday. I'll see you then. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us. Pray the Holy Spirit would, would guide and disclose the teachings. In Jesus' name, amen.